My name is Nathan Johanning. I'm an extension educator in local food systems and small farms uh, for University of Illinois Extension. And I work uh, primarily in southern Illinois out of uh, Murfreesboro, Illinois. So we'll start off uh, talking about just some general pumpkin facts. Um, first of all, it's always Illinois is fairly proud that we are the number one uh, pumpkin producing state, and this is for both ornamental and processing pumpkins. So, and as far as the processing side, 90 to 95 percent of the U.S. processing pumpkins are grown in Illinois. So. Other interesting things relating to pumpkins uh, behind Christmas, Halloween uh, anymore is the uh, holiday that Americans spend the most money on. So there's a lot of you know marketing opportunities there for some of these crops. So these fall cucurbit crops, which include pumpkins, gourds, and squash, and various things like that, can make a great niche market for a small farm operation. It's uh, something that's fairly uh, fairly easy to incorporate in, and definitely has uh, is is relatively easy to create a market for in your area. So no, there's uh, lots of marketing opportunities, uh, whether it be you pick uh, farmers markets. Uh, school tours, uh, and other agritourism opportunities. So there's lots of uh, potential there. And usually, I think our best marketing time is uh, from September, early September, through October 31st. And why I put October 31st specifically is anyone that's grown pumpkins would know is that that whenever you want to see a market drop off, as soon as Halloween is over, the market for uh, especially jack-o'-lantern pumpkins uh, just plummets completely. And so if there's a pumpkin left uh, before Halloween, it's worth can be worth quite a bit after Halloween, not so much. The market does linger some for fall decor, but overall it really does end at Halloween. So we'll start off with uh, some production considerations. So here's just a few things that we'll be touching on in the first part of this presentation. We'll talk about site selection, soil fertility, uh, variety selection, and then pest management, some of the main uh, pests that we have in uh, pumpkin and gourd production. We'll start off specifically here on site selection. So pumpkins don't tolerate waterlogged soils very well, so make sure to uh, you want to choose a site that's fairly well drained. Um, some some say the sandy soils are the best, but especially here in Illinois, uh, a lot of the soils here in Illinois, uh, pumpkins would do fairly well on. But do try to keep them out of areas, especially areas that might be prone to intermittent flooding, maybe during heavy rain. Should we get a heavy rain uh, during the pumpkin uh, growing season, uh, you want to avoid that. And uh, so an area, especially had a little bit of slope or something, would be would be ideal. You do want to rotate away from these cucurbit crops or anything in this cucurbit family, which would include any of your melons, cucumbers, and things like that, uh, for at least three years, which is preferred between your next planting. It has a lot of influences with uh, reducing disease and insect issues just by, just as you would rotate any, uh, any other crop in a garden or a crop production setting. Another thing to think about is ease of field access for crop maintenance and harvest. Uh, pumpkins typically uh, you s will spend a fair amount of time making, you know, maybe making some fungicide or insecticide sprays. In some cases, you'll have planting. You'll need to get into the field, and of course, harvest. You need uh, lots of access to the field, whether it be if you're uh, having something to have a U pick. Obviously, uh, accessibility is very important for that. But even with the uh, with just having some that you're harvesting yourself and taking to other markets, you still you're going to have to spend uh, many trips in and out of that field. So you want it to be somewhere that's relatively easy to get to. Also, the availability of water. Uh, this is something that uh, not all ir not all situations do you need irrigation, but do you want to have that option to irrigate with some of the uh, erratic weather patterns we have. I think uh, over the last at least five years, I think almost anyone that's grown pumpkins would have at some point in time wished that they had the option to irrigate. So, so that's something, it's not essential, but it is something to consider when you're choosing a site. 
add as far as soil nutrients and soil fertility, the best thing, of course, with any crop is to start with a soil test. So you need to know what your soil has and how that, uh, and so you can start there as far as uh, your fertility program and what you may need to try to add to the soil. So here's just some baseline nutrient levels for your pH. I'm measuring the acidity of the soil around 6 to 6.5 is, uh, is the ideal range. Uh, phosphorus, usually looking around 40 to 50 pounds per acre. And potassium, somewhere around 260 to 300 pounds per acre. So this is, this is just a general baseline. Like I say, if you're, it's not to say that pumpkins won't grow if you're below this, but just in trying to optimize uh, plant growth, these are your ideal ranges to start off as a baseline. And if you are, once you're in production, every three to five years, it's good to uh, resample fields to monitor those nutrient levels. So as far as specifically for pumpkins and gourds, uh, your maintenance fertilizer or what is the annual fertilizer need for pumpkins? As far as nitrogen, uh, we usually think anywhere from 60 to 120 pounds of nitrogen, uh, actual nitrogen per acre. Now that's a wide range and a lot of that has to do with a couple factors. First part, uh, you use lower rates on soils that have a higher organic matter content. So this would be more typical of your central and northern Illinois soils that often have a higher organic matter content and therefore that organic matter can help to provide some nitrogen back to the plants. You can use higher nitrogen rates, so closer to maybe that 100 to 120 pounds of nitrogen on soils with lower organic matter, which is more common in uh, southern Illinois. So you're less than 2% organic matter because the soil has less capability to naturally provide that organic or provide that nitrogen. Another thing to consider is to use some higher rates of nitrogen when using uh, a cereal grain cover crop, especially in a no-till situation. Sometimes those grains can tie up some extra nitrogen. So in that case, I would consider, you know, definitely sticking to that 100 to 120 pounds, maybe even going a little bit higher than that. What you don't want to do is you don't want to over fertilize on nitrogen just because in that case, nitrogen uh, promotes vegetative growth. And of course, we want fruit along with leaves. So we want a nice balance of that. So if you basically, if you over apply nitrogen, you can get uh, more leaves and less fruit. So that's usually not as desirable, of course. So as far as phosphorus and potassium, just some general recommendations uh, are around 50 pounds per acre of phosphorus and of potassium around 125 pounds per acre. And those rates are given that you would have a, a soil test value around uh, what we had uh, recommended here in the previous slide. So if you have soil test values lower than that, uh, you can uh, increase those amounts. If you are in excess of uh, the, the recommendations in the previous slide, then actually in some cases you might not even need to uh, add additional nutrients. So as far as planting methods, there are many different variations on how uh, people will go about uh, uh, planting pumpkins. Um, there's a couple different things and we'll kind of touch on e each of them to give some perspectives on the uh, pros and cons and just some insight into each of these. You have conventional tilled system versus a no-till system as far as just the tillage of the soil, utilization of cover crops or just using uh, bare soil. You can directly seed uh, seeds into the soil or you can uh, transplant out uh, young plants. You can hand plant for either of these or you can plant with a mechanical device. And you can also use plastic mulches in some cases, so like black plastic, which is used on many other vegetable crops. So here in the pictures you can see uh, we have, uh, you know, in some cases, hand planting can be just using, simply using a hoe and uh, digging a small, uh, you know, a small hill, putting in a few seeds and covering them up. You can see them below that. We have, uh, this is actually on my own uh, farm. This is actually we're using a mechanical transplanter to hand, to uh, mechanically transplant plants. And then a lot of times for seeders, uh, for direct seeding, 
we have in this case is the image of a modified corn planter unit, no-till corn planter unit, which can be used for pumpkins. So as your tillage systems, you either usually have conventional tillage or no tillage. Uh, conventional tillage is still very, uh, very common. Um, often it relies on multiple cultivations for weed control, uh, less reliance on herbicides, but still herbicides are often used. Uh, one thing with that is any time you till, you're going to have the potential to bring up new flushes of weed seeds. So if you till and get a light rain, you brought new seeds to the surface, so that's one kind of disadvantage. Uh, another thing is it can be hard to access the field after rain. After you've tilled the area, it can get very muddy, more so than under uh, limited tillage situations. And also there's an the increased erosion potential that comes whenever from a conservation standpoint. No-till, on the other hand, so this is where you have a stale seed bed, so there's no tillage and the soil has not been worked. So you can often can have fewer flushes of weeds because if you can start clean and clean up the soil, you can uh, more or less uh, eliminate bringing up new seeds to the surface because you haven't done anything to disturb the soil. Now this system is more reliant on herbicides and often cover crops to control the weeds. So you don't have tillage as an option uh, for weed control. And there you have less erosion potential and also just overall better conditions and for uh, better soil health. So as far as uh, cover crops, I had mentioned, uh, mentioned these. So what are some benefits of utilizing cover crops? Well, the biggest thing, uh, one of the biggest things is cleaner fruit and the fruit not lying directly on the soil. So cleaner fruit is, is definitely a marketing uh, issue um, because, uh, and, and labor issue because if you have muddy fruit, that would uh, you know, be one more labor to try to clean them, whether it be to wash or to have to wipe them off as you're picking them up out of the field. And I will say that in my opinion, um, a, a clean pumpkin is probably the, one of the easiest ones to sell. If you had a clean pumpkin and a muddy pumpkin sitting beside each other, I think the clean one would uh, most always probably uh, uh, win the sale. So also there can even be some uh, disease management benefits from not having the fruit directly lying on the uh, soil, especially under wet conditions. Uh, cover crops also help to suppress weeds, uh, especially when you use the small grain cover crops. Uh, some of the uh, cover crops that are legumes, such as clovers and vetches and things, also produce nitrogen. So that can be uh, added benefit. So in that case, you can, uh, in some case, reduce some of your nitrogen needs from synthetic fertilizers. And it's also easier field access and for harvesting and other things, uh, other field operations, because you'll have that cover on the soil. It's no-till, so the soil is more solid than it would be if it's uh, been recently tilled. And, uh, and that, that can be a, uh, a big gain because if it rains in the uh, middle or end of September and you're needing to be harvesting, you know, in some cases, if you need to go to a market, you might need to be out there no matter what. So it can be a lot, uh, a lot more pleasant uh, conditions. I know I use a no-till system um, with a cover crop, and I'll say that I've had to go in after a couple inch rain, and I can go in and not even really get terribly muddy uh, on my farm just because of having those conditions. And I think if it had been a tilled situation in bare soil, I think that would have been a completely different story. It's also a habitat for beneficial insects, and overall it's just uh, good for the soil health. So some things to think about um, with cover crops. They do rely heavily on herbicides along with the uh, cover crop residue for weed control. Um, you can have some issues uh, planting into or transplanting into some cover crop residue, so you have to make sure you have equipment that is adapted to handle that added residue. Um, in some cases, heavy residue can keep the soil wet during excessively wet weather at planting, which we've had in some of the recent years. And it does require some additional management. I tell other people you need to manage your cover crops very similar to you would a, another crop. You can't just throw them out and forget about them. Also, vole and mice predation of seeds and even of fruit. Uh, can be an issue because you have uh, that cover crop residue makes an ideal environment and kind of uh, 
happy home for some of those small four-legged critters as well. So cover crop options. So what are the most common? I would say most commonly we would think about uh, some of the small grains such as wheat and cereal rye. And there's some others, triticale, barley, and other small grains that would also work. Wheat and cereal rye are probably some of the most prevalent. So uh, the uh, residue is very good at suppressing weeds. And the picture you can see there, that's uh, actually after wheat. So you see you have all that residue that can help with suppress weeds. And also it's where the uh, fruit can lie on top of that rather than on the soil surface. And the residue of most of these small grains does have the ability to last season long. It does not break down terribly quickly, so it will be there throughout the growing season. Uh, the legumes are also very good as a nitrogen pr producer, as I suggested, but they don't provide as much weed suppression. These residues uh, tend to break down very quickly, and so they don't linger throughout the growing season as effectively. And oftentimes we're seeing now a mixture of small grains and legumes being utilized. So as far as actual planting techniques, direct seeding is, a, is a very common. This is where you just have seeds planted either by hand or with a modified corn planter or other planting device. Uh, typically, you, in this case, you would overplant the seeds and then uh, thin the plants to achieve your desired plant population. Since you won't get every seed to come up and you may have some that may be in some cases eaten by mice or voles or other things like that, you want to overplant and that way you make sure you have, and then go back and remove some plants. So it does take a little bit more seed. Uh, here down below you can see uh, both. You can also use something as simple as a, uh, a earthway garden seed or, or other similar device. In this, in the other one, you can see a uh, this is a John Deere uh, uh, no-till uh, corn unit that's been uh, modified inside to accept pumpkin seeds, and uh, and that also works very effectively to uh, uh, to plant the seeds, especially on a larger acreage. And you can also just, like I said earlier, simply uh, plant them by hand. So the, another option is transplanting. So uh, in this case, you're going to transplant by hand, which you can do with just a hand trowel on, on a small or even modest scales, or using a mechanical transplanter. So you can see there, and we'll go into a little more, show you a little bit about mechanical transplanters if you haven't seen them. In the top, that's a picture where I'm actually uh, setting a plant in the transplanter in the field. And one thing to think about when you're doing transplants, the transplants need to have around two to three weeks, or have around a two to three week head start on growing compared to direct seeding. Because remember, you're setting out a plant that's usually around three weeks old. And so rather than putting a seed out there, you have a head start. This can be beneficial for uh, weeds. Uh, it also avoids the seed predation by, uh, uh, by rodents and things like that. And it's also a more efficient use of seed. You can plant out your seed. A lot of times you can see in the picture what I use is like a 72 cell plug tray. And uh, you can uh, plant your seeds out in there. They have what I call a relatively ideal germination environment. And then we can, uh, you can pull those plants out and that way you uh, get the uh, most value for use of some of your seeds. You're not having to thin the plants. So you can see you can get the picture below. You can see you have a very consistent stand uh, and you have a good plant spacing without having to go back and thin or do other modifications. So here I have a few images. So this is, uh, this is what a mechanical transplanter would, uh, would look like. You can see you can, in this case, you can have two people sitting on there setting plants. Uh, you have a water tank, um, which I would say is probably beneficial for, especially for pumpkins, that way you can deliver some uh, nutrient solution uh, to the plants and some water to help get them established. And for a no-till situation, you can see there's an added disc and also a, uh, a, a small tooth in the front that will help to open up the soil ahead of, uh, ahead of the transplanter coming through. And then when you're at the actual transplanter in operation, here you can see 
Um, the uh, picture on the left, you have a plant that has uh, just been set into that we call a pocket. That's that black kind of rubber finger that's holding it. So it uh, right before that, those are on a chain. I, that plant was placed into there. It closed up and holds that. That chain goes down, and then from the back view, you can see that goes down, and once it gets to the bottom, it opens up, lets go of that plant, and then lays the plant, and then the press wheels uh, firm the soil in around the uh, tra newly transplanted transplant. So the other option, I'm talking about plastic mulch. Um, this can be used, but it's not as common, uh, commonly utilized in pumpkins. Some, in some cases it is. It depends on your production system and what equipment you have available. Um, plastic mulch in some cases can actually get the plants too warm, especially with black plastic mulch, uh, especially for central and southern Illinois. Um, once above 95 degrees, the fruit set of pumpkins is fairly limited. So. In this case, black plastic uh, we think of traditionally as using more for early or maybe late season crops to add uh, moisture to the soil. But overall, for the most part, um, you want to make sure to keep uh, temperatures a little bit uh, a little bit lower, so that way you get better fruit set. And this, so black plastic could be a benefit more in uh, in northern Illinois. Uh, where added heat uh, can help to push plant growth um, up in there, you know, added heat might be a benefit, but in southern and central Illinois, oftentimes, at least most years, we have more than ample, uh, ample heat uh, available naturally. So uh, another thing, of course, to think about with uh, black plastic, uh, you have the fact you have added expense of the plastic, you have the removal of the plastic, so if you're going to do strictly one crop, would pumpkins be good? Now where sometimes it is utilized is on farm operations where you have other crops such as, you know, strawberries or tomatoes or other things growing on the plastic and you can get an additional crop out of the plastic. That could be, uh, and that might be something where you'd want to utilize it, uh, utilize black plastic for pumpkins and it would work uh, relatively well. Uh, however, uh, in this case, um, it's not necessarily as beneficial uh, to use for strictly for the um, uh, for pumpkin production. The other thing is, of course, pumpkins grow or are mainly planted in the midsummer, so you don't necessarily need uh, added heat at that time of year as you would if this is a crop you're trying to plant early in, say, March or April. So for planting date, um, pumpkins range in maturity anywhere from some newer uh, short season varieties from 85 days on up to 120 days. So hey Nathan, yes, just a quick question. There was a question about the transplanter. What would a typical, you know, one row, two seat transplanter cost? Okay, sure. Uh, and uh, as far as a transplanter goes. Um, I will tell you that uh, I actually, the transplant that I have there, I've, I recently purchased, um, and I think it cost around $3,500 to $4,000, and that was one set up for, um, for no-till situations. You can find that sometimes at uh, auctions and other things, a vegetable production auction, you can find older transplanter units um, that, uh, for for far less than that, you can probably even find some transplanter units. The, the technology has been the same from oh for many many decades. Um, it's just some different twist on the same uh, same thing. But as far as that new one, I will tell you that's about what I uh, paid for that. But if you've ever had a chance to use one and compared to doing it by hand, you can very easily justify. Uh, some of these expenses. So, uh, but uh, and like I say, I think uh, you could probably maybe knock another maybe thousand or so off of that if you went with a non-no-till version. So, that's uh, kind of a rough ballpark as far as uh, direct uh, soil transplanters. So, as far as your planting date, um, one thing to think about is just when you want to start harvest. So oftentimes, and we'll talk, uh, I'll mention later on, usually, you know, mid-June is probably whenever you would uh, 
or excuse me, not mid June, uh, mid September, excuse me, is when you want to start about thinking about harvesting. Um, so that would a lot of times lead you to the mid May through mid June time for your ideal planting range. Another thing, as you head north, think about when your first frost is going to be. Um, pumpkin fruit themselves do not get injured dramatically by a light frost or freeze, but the plants in, will pretty well cease all forward growth if you get a frost on the leaves, and especially a, a widespread freeze. So in that case, you uh, even though you may not want to harvest till October 1st, if you're further north, you may want to push harvest up because the pumpkins will keep uh, if you uh, harvest them, but uh, certainly want to make sure to get the plants mature before you get that uh, killing frost. So generally mid-May through mid-June, this is when you direct seed or plant seeds. Um, the earlier in northern Illinois and later in southern Illinois, um, and for transplanting, the general rule is I always allow three weeks to grow transplants from seeds. So that's your general rule. So if you want to transplant, uh, in this case, maybe the 1st of July, you know, start three weeks ahead to get uh, transplant started. So another thing that's very important for pumpkin production is pollinators. So anything from honeybees, bumblebees, squash bees, uh, even some of our insect pests can that crawl around in the flowers can do some uh, pollination. And that's very important to pumpkin fruit set. Uh, research has shown that the more bee visits a pumpkin flower gets, the larger the fruit. So uh, how pumpkins grow, a little bit about their uh, reproductive uh, strategies and systems. So they have separate male and female flowers. So don't be alarmed if not every flower has a fruit on it because there will be male flowers. And this is similar with zucchini and some of the other cucurbits. The female flowers will be the flowers that come out that have what looks to be a small green uh, fruit right beneath the flower. And those flowers open very early in the morning and usually close by late morning, and they only open once. So if a pumpkin flower doesn't reopen, so it has one shot in one morning to uh, to be pollinated. So, and optimally, we you know ideally would like anywhere from 12 to 15 bee visits per female flower. And so this would be what would be optimal in general for uh, optimal uh, fruit production. And a part of this is the more pollen that that fruit gets and that flower gets, the more seeds it's produced. And the more seeds, there's a direct relationship with the number of seeds in the fruit and the fruit size just due to the, uh, a lot of it's due to the natural plant growth regulators that the, uh, and plant hormones that the seeds produce with respect to that fruit and cause that fruit to enlarge with additional seeds. So another thing, and this is probably one of the most fun things about uh, pumpkins, is variety selection. There are just so many different varieties out there, and I, I just I have a few slides to try to help illustrate this. But I, but please believe me, there I didn't do didn't even tip the iceberg as far as the number of varieties and diversity there is that's available today. There's different sizes, different shapes, different colors, differences in maturity, uh, so how long it takes to produce a fruit. Um, and there's also differences in disease resistance or tolerance. And also you want to look at just market demand. What does your area uh, demand. In some cases, you might have a uh, demand for uh, maybe just jack-o'-lanterns, or maybe it could be that you have a demand for, um, you know, some of the other specialty types. So that's uh, very important. So the next few slides, I'll try to just give you a few pictures of some of the variety. Um, and I'll try to label as much as I can. Um, in this case, uh, we have uh, cotton candy, which is the uh, white pumpkins. You see there's a really popular variety in uh, uh, for white pumpkins. Probably they range in that maybe uh, 8 to at most maybe 10 or 15 pound size. Uh, Long Island cheese are the tan colored ones. <coughs> 
Uh, blue Jaredale, you can, they're kind of hiding here, but those are the flat blue ones. Uh, uh, those are very commonly used. Most of the Long Island cheese and blue Jaredale are great ones for cooking, which is becoming uh, more and more popular. Uh, red warty thing is the red ones in the back. Uh, autumn gold is a smaller, just an orange jack-o'-lantern type. And then one too many is this really neat uh, a white background with a orangish reddish variegation. You can see the variegation stays green uh, whenever um, whenever the uh, where the plant uh, lays on the soil surface. But these, especially the one too many, have really become very popular in the last few years. People uh, love the diversity. Here's just some more. You can see some striped kushas. Um, you can also have some variations on the blue Jaredale and some other sizes and shapes. Uh, stacking pumpkins, I'm sure if many of you have seen as far as uh, decorating, is very become a, a very big deal. There's a lot of flat pumpkins, as I would call them, or those that work very well in, uh, in stacking. Um, so those are some, uh, some other uh, varieties and some different you have there. And the larger jack-o'-lanterns uh, and larger pumpkins, uh, as far as the gourd side, you have um, baby boo, which is a standard of the small white kind of pumpkin gourd. Jack B. Little, which is the orange version of that. Uh, uh, Little Pumpkimon, which is the, uh, the orange and white variegated one you see very commonly. Um, those are also very, um, very popular, especially with kids and other things uh, and other customer base. Also in the gourds, you have um, autumn wings. These, the autumn wings are very popular. Those are the, uh, the very colorful gourds there on the bottom that have basically kind of wings or fins. Generally, they have kind of a bottleneck type shape to them. Uh, very popular. Um, then you have more of a standard older type gourd. I think this variety is actually just called a fancy mixed gourd. Most catalogs will have a variety that's that's more similar to this older open pollinated variety, um, also very popular. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, just to add, there's uh, and I didn't have any good pictures on this offhand, but there's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of just orange jack-o'-lantern pumpkins of all shapes, sizes, different shades of orange. Um, and anywhere from what we would call a pie pumpkin, which is traditionally a pumpkin maybe closer to uh, maybe softball or a little larger in size. That especially is great for small kids and, you know, table decorations on up to large jack-o'-lanterns going from uh, 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 to 50 pounds. Or in some cases, some of the really large ones up over 100 pounds. So there's all kinds of different uh, variety of pumpkins. And so one thing that I would say, if you're looking to do a uh, small farm enterprise and marketing, get a good variety because that is something that's really beneficial to uh, marketing. Everyone loves a good uh, variety of pumpkins. So these are just some, a couple examples of some commercial seed sources that you can get larger quantities of seeds. Um, I will say this is not an exclusive list, and I'm not ne necessarily um, promoting any one, but I just wanted to give you some company names just so you have something, some things you can, uh, of course, uh, easily uh, search these on the Internet and find these companies. Uh, Rupps, uh, Johnny Select Seed, Seedway, Rispens, um, Stokes, Hummerts, uh, Home Seed Company, and there's many others uh, you can look, uh, look up for commercial vegetable seeds and find all kinds of variety. And often these will all have a little bit different, uh, uh, different variety. They will have um, just a, a large variety of uh, uh, seeds. Uh, I'll just and a couple, a couple questions for you. Sure. There's one, uh, is, is anyone, uh, Brenda wanted to know if there was a best pumpkin for roasting seeds and eating. And sure. uh, you, did, you did mention the, the the pie, so go ahead, sure. and then I got another one after that. Sure. No, I I, I got the questions here. Uh, as far as the uh, the best one for roasting, um, really, I think probably uh, depends on your personal um, 
taste, but uh, a lot of times just the uh, regular um, jack-o'-lantern pumpkins um, can have decent seeds for uh, roasting. There are also are some um, that uh, are newer, but they um, there's some that have what we call a naked seed coat, or they're hullless seeds. Um, there's a couple of companies that have those, so the seed is black. Uh, this is actually what they use for like making pumpkin seed oil. It's a different. It's different than what your traditional uh, carving pumpkin would be. Um, and so uh, those are also some that are excellent for roasting. But really, you can uh, can roast uh, most any of the seeds. So, and as far as uh, there's a question about uh, cross pollination between varieties, and as far as how they should be separated by space. Um, Usually that's not an issue as far as getting a cross-pollination. That would be an issue if you were saving the seed to plant the, to uh, saving the seed to plant something the next year. You would want to especially then make sure, uh, make sure that you have a separation of space that you're not getting pollen crossed in those seeds. But as far as the varieties, actually, if you plant seeds you've purchased and, and want to make sure you get that same pumpkin to come out. I plant about an acre or two of pumpkins. I think I have probably around 25 or more different varieties and I'll put one side by side and uh, and you uh, really can't go wrong with uh, with that. You'll get the usually almost exactly what, uh, what you should out of that. A um, couple other things and look at the chat for some other ideas. Like I say these are just a few of my commercial seed sources. There's some other uh, contributions there. Some other people have some uh, good uh, suggestions. As far as, as far as the pollinators, uh, yes, in a lot of cases we do use um, beehives or bring in beehives for pollination. Um, that's very common. Another thing to use is use cover crops or other crops such as buckwheat or some of the clovers that attract bees. Anything you can do to promote bees in the area where you're growing pumpkins is definitely beneficial. And oftentimes if you're in an area that's maybe uh, not near uh, a wooded area, uh, maybe you're in the middle of um, other agronomic production fields where you don't have a lot of natural bees, it is beneficial to bring in some beehives. There is one yeah. last question there about a, a bush type variety. Can you name one off the top of your head? Uh, a bush type, uh, there is uh, one of them as far as a uh, pie pumpkin uh, size, a smaller size pumpkin. A touch of autumn is one that is more of a bush type. That's another thing you'll notice in seed catalogs. They'll say from, um, they'll say from uh, more of a, a longer vining pumpkin, and then you'll see semi-bush and bush type. A lot of that just has to do with uh, how far uh, how far out they will vine. Sometimes that's related to the uh, somewhat direct indirectly related to the size. A lot of times the more vining we think of being with a larger pumpkin, um, but it isn't necessarily the case. Uh, so yeah, there are some uh, some varieties that are bush type and take up less space and don't you know run from one side of your uh, patch to another. But some of them will uh, will run for many many feet. So as far as pest management. Um, pest management is definitely a key to successful pumpkin production. Some resources to utilize, uh, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, um, which I have pictured here uh, off to the right. It's great for uh, pest management, soil fertility, general planning information. Uh, you can download it for free uh, at the website link I have listed here. Uh, otherwise, you can also uh, you can purchase it. I know in Illinois, it's usually available at most extension offices, and I think if you would uh, if you look it up online, you can also order it, order a copy online. Um, another good resource for uh, pumpkin production is the book Identifying and Managing Cucurbit Pests. So you see that picture below. This is a great uh, resource for having good color pictures, especially your insect and disease pest. Also has some of your weed pest, and it goes and it will give you a lot of pictures. So if you're trying to identify a certain problem you're having with uh, cucurbit crops, it's a great resource. 
unfortunately, it is not available as a uh, as a free download. But if you go to the link I have listed here, you can order a paper copy. It costs eleven dollars. And if you're really interested in in uh, uh, producing cucurbit crops, I really think that's a uh, a really good investment. So going on with that, I've given you those resources, and especially the uh, Midwest Vegetable Production Guide has specifics as far as pesticides that are labeled and what they're labeled for. So due to time constraints, which I know I'm uh, definitely running shy on, I'm not going to go in the details of those, um, but certainly can address uh, individual questions and refer to those resources for those specifics. So importance of weed management. Weeds and pumpkin plant competition can severely reduce your uh, yields. It's uh, far more limiting uh, to crop yields than insects or, uh, or even uh, diseases, if not controlled. Um, insects and diseases are extremely comp important, but if you do nothing, you know, no cultivation, no hoeing, no nothing to remove weeds, I guarantee you that insects and diseases will be the least of your worries. <clears throat> So weeds can also limit the air movement. So they can increase the incidence of some plant diseases because you have uh, less movement, which is especially uh, critical to dry the leaves. In some cases, some diseases like the more moist uh, and humid environment, then we have additional foliage from the weeds. You're going to increase those incidents. It also can reduce or interfere with spray coverage of pesticide applications. Uh, traditionally, we do make uh, especially fungicide and insecticide applications, and for that you want to, uh, as best you can, get thorough coverage on the on the leaves of the crop. So if you have other uh, plants in there, you can uh, uh, more or less have uh, a you're spraying your uh, pesticides on the weeds and not actually getting them to the crop where you need them. And weeds can also harbor insects and diseases. So that's another important reason to keep weeds out of your pumpkin field. So, and if you don't succeed, this is what your pumpkin field can look like. So, uh, so in this case, you can see uh, whenever you have a field that looks like this, your yield is obviously going to be limited. And I certainly hope that that's not a you pick patch because I don't think many people are going to be very excited about picking pumpkins out of that. I know I'm not excited whenever I have to pick pumpkins out of things that look like that. So it's not only just, you know, uh, crop production, it's just, uh, it's, it's not practical or sometimes even pleasant in those. So weed control is important. So what are some problematic weeds? Uh, most problematic are probably your broadleaf weeds as weeds that are the similar to the, most similar to the crop tend to be most problematic. Um, amaranthus species, so that'd be things such as your common, your pigweeds and water hemp's. Uh, and Palmer amaranth are some of the specifics. So the in the pigweed family, as we say, those are very problematic and uh, can reoccur throughout the season. Morning glories, they can wrap up and vine on things and cause all kinds of problems and just kind of overtake um, uh, overtake plants. Uh, hop hornbeam copper leaf. That is actually the weed that is shown to answer the question. That is hop hornbeam copper leaf is what I have the picture of. It's a uh, not a widespread weed, but it is in certain areas. It, when uh, when you have it in pumpkins, it can be very problematic. It tends to germinate across the growing season of pumpkins, even late in the year. And it, as you can see, grows and kind of bushes out. And at the wrong time of year, if it gets ahead of the pumpkins, it can really crowd out the uh, the pumpkins. Um, common and giant ragweed, or sometimes it's called horseweed, depending on where you're at in the state. Um, also crabgrass, foxtail, and even volunteer small grains. In that picture, you can see some volunteer wheat, and those can also uh, take uh, take up some uh, some. Uh, competition and also in some cases we can even tie up some nitrogen those small wheat plants that will uh, limit your pumpkin production. So how do we address weeds? Um, herbicides are probably the most common, um, one of the most common means. Um, Pre-emergence herbicides, so herbicides before weeds come up or before pumpkins are planted are very common. 
uh, once the uh, pumpkins are planted, you have very limited options, especially for broadleaf weeds. There are some herbicides that will control grasses. Um, we also use what we call post-directed sprays. So this is basically spraying things such as maybe uh, Roundup, which is uh, the active ingredient is glyphosate, or uh, Paraquat, which is a restricted use pesticide, but is often used commonly um, in these applications. What it's doing is using a herbicide that you cannot um, spray, say, a blanket over the top of the crop, but you can selectively spray between crop rows and kill the weeds. Uh, it does require specialized equipment, such as hooded sprayers or using a backpack sprayer. You can't just broadcast spray it over the entire crop. Uh, cover crops or a no-till situation are some ways to uh, uh, manage weeds. Tillage and cultivation are also used, and uh, hand weeding and hoeing. So in this case, um, uh, overall, you know, the overall goal is to start clean. You know, if you're starting off with a tilled field, if it's a, um, a no-till field, you want to have a herbicide application or some weed control application right before you plant because once those plants have emerged or they're in the field, your control options limit very quickly and that uh, hand weeding and hoeing uh, becomes a lot more prevalent and it still is uh, utilized. I will say the best weed management practice is probably a combination of multiple ones. So in my instance, I utilize herbicides, cover crops, and hand weeding and hoeing all just to keep those pumpkins as clean as possible. So as far as insect management, uh, the most common insect pests are uh, some of these listed here. These are not exclusive, but these are the most common. Uh, some of your striped and spotted cucumber beetles, that would be the uh, picture to the left, would be a striped cucumber beetle, squash bug, your picture in the center, and squash vine borer. And then on the picture to the right, you can see the squash vine borer uh, list, or, uh, they're uh, tunneling inside the uh, stem of a cucurbit crop. So those are three uh, pests that can be probably the most problematic uh, and need to be monitored and then controlled. So insects can defoliate plants. They can injure or scar fruit. In the uh, case of the cucumber beetle, they can actually feed on stems and even on the skins of young fruits and cause some scarring on them. And in the case of the squash vine borer, they can kill entire plants if they get into the plant. And uh, you know, in that case, they're hollowing out the vascular system of the plant and causing it to suddenly wilt and die. <clears throat> and as far as uh, insecticides, these are most commonly utilized. Um, there are insecticide options available for uh, both uh, conventional and organic production. Um, and uh, so those options are there. Uh, and crop rotation is also something that's important to help uh, manage many insect pests just because if uh, the more times you have that same crop uh, in the uh, same place, you're going to have insect populations build up. Um, these insects, and I won't go through specifics, some overwinter on residue and other things. So crop rotation uh, is definitely beneficial from many standpoints, including insect management. All right, I'll just take just a quick minute, just a couple of questions. Um, as far as uh, uh, the cover crop that's easiest to control, um, a lot of your cereal grains are fairly easy to control. Um, you do need to watch out for uh, having them go to seed. Um, if they go to seed and you're not harvesting the seed, then you can end up with volunteer plants. Um, but in that very sum, and we can talk, I'd be happy to answer specific questions at a later time. Um, as far as a companion plant recommendation, um, I would say that uh, I have not found anything that I've been terribly satisfied with as a companion plant that grows simultaneously. Um, if you had irrigation, this could be better, but my main concern is a lot of time those companion plants are also very good competitors for water and also sometimes nutrients. And so I have not 
personally haven't come across anything or heard of anything that works well as a companion plant because oftentimes in the time of year we're growing pumpkins, uh, we also have can have issues with water shortages as well in the dry times where the pumpkins need all the water they can get. So that's, that's in my opinion, and from what I've seen, I haven't come up with anything that's really uh, worked well. Now, if anyone else has, has any other comments, I would certainly um, – uh, certainly uh, uh, entertain, you know, hearing what you guys would have to say. Uh, as far as uh, disease management, uh, most common diseases, there's three main ones, powdery mildew, which is something you see almost every year, it's very common, downy mildew, which is less common but does come on occasion, and then bacterial spot, and from uh, left to right, that's the pictures there you see listed, are, those are uh, pathogens that are fairly common. Uh, powdery mildew, which is the most common, you can see on the leaf in the background of the picture, is just kind of covered in white with kind of this powdery uh, growth on it. And then also in this, what this picture is focusing on is on the actual leaf petiole, uh, the leaf stem. You can see there the small white uh, spots on there is the uh, basically evidence of that pathogen or disease that's on pumpkins. So how would you manage diseases? Uh, crop rotation is very, uh, very important, again, uh, to help break up that uh, crop cycle or that disease cycle. Plant-resistant varieties, and this is for uh, specifically for uh, powdery mildew. Now, I will, I will note that uh, when we say resistant varieties, that is not complete resistance. Uh, and this mainly means that the plants are tolerant. They will still get powdery mildew, so if you plant a quote, resistant variety, uh, and it does get powdery mildew, don't be alarmed, but they'll tolerate the disease much better, and oftentimes they won't get the disease as early, but do know that it still can affect them, so it's not a, uh, a fail-safe as if a resistant variety will solve all of your disease issues. Fungicides are very common. Um, many of these fungicides are protectants and they prevent infection. So often once you see a widespread outbreak, it's too late for some of these fungicides to be terribly effective. So what do you need to do? You should scout fields often, especially starting from around late July through the end of the season. That's whenever some of these diseases are the worst. Uh, so you need to scout, especially uh, like powdery mildew uh, typically shows up first on the stems in the lower part of the plant. So start looking there and make sure you're out in the field the same way for insects. Make sure you scout to uh, see what's out there and know, uh, know what you have. And especially on diseases, uh, if you let them get out of hand, there's often very little you can do to recover uh, some of those plants, even with, uh, with some uh, good fungicides. Other pests to be concerned about, uh, mice and voles, we mentioned this before about seed predation. They can also feed on the fruit, so sometimes you can get scarring on the leaf surface. Some cases they can actually even tunnel into fruits. Uh, and certainly because most of our pumpkins are for ornamental purposes, if we uh, have any defect on the surface, that's going to make it potentially uh, more difficult to sell. Um, I've seen plenty of pumpkins that have nice little uh, double teeth marks from where a mice, or where a mouse or vole has taken a nice little nibble out of it um, when it's younger, and that heals over and has a nice, nice little scar in it. So um, obviously these can be more problematic with cover crops, um, but uh, so that's so basically it's, sometimes it's things that can be managed, but just know it's something that you uh, might need to address more specifically under cover crop situations. Deer, um, generally we think of them as not being a problem, but I know especially uh, if any of you are in southern Illinois, I've had, uh, definitely I've had uh, growers, pumpkin growers call and ask me about how to keep the deer out of their uh, pumpkins. They will uh, feed on leaves and also sometimes even young green fruits. They will take a nice little bite out of them, which will more or less leave a kind of misshapen pumpkin with a scar on the side. Uh, and it's especially, uh, they're kind of creatures of habit. If you don't have a problem with them, you might not, but if for some reason they found they like them, um, then they will probably be back for more. Um, and then also in some cases, hum uh, uh, 
humans. Uh, in this case, you know, your uh, two-legged uh, uh, pest can also cause some uh, some issues in pumpkins, so that might be something to think about with respect to site selection and and where you put your pumpkin uh, pumpkin field at. Uh, uh, just a quick question here: What herbicide can be used in a field that has both? sweet corn and pumpkins. Uh, one herbicide option as far as residual weed control is a product dual uh, magnum or dual two magnum is specifically dual two I think is the one that offhand is labeled in sweet corn and in pumpkins. There are some others uh, that can be used. That's probably the most prevalent as far as the residual herbicide. So it's dual two as in uh, as two, uh, the Roman numeral two magnum. And uh, as far as uh, disease-resistant varieties, there are some uh, powdery mildew-resistant varieties. The jack-o'-lantern variety is Magic Lantern is one. There's multiple ones, and most of your seed catalogs will have a category listing for uh, disease resistance, and they'll give you a letter designation or some kind of way to denote uh, disease resistance. Touch of Autumn, that bush type pie pumpkin I mentioned before, is also has powdery mildew tolerance or resistance. So those are two examples, but there are multiple ones. Uh, it's not terribly common, but there are some that have uh, disease resistance. As far as morning glories and thistles in your pumpkin patch, um, I, I hate to say good luck, but uh, persistence is probably the best way, and we can talk more specifically about uh, some of the weed management strategies uh, you can use, but uh, those two uh, weeds can be very, very problematic. So harvest, uh, as, as far as harvest goes, um, you want to harvest fruit when they have their full mature color. In this case, um, whatever color that may be, if you have some of the uh, uh, specialty type pumpkins. Uh, for jack o' lantern pumpkins, um, some green color on them will uh, change and will color up after harvest. So if they're orange with maybe some uh, light uh, green or some green in the veins, oftentimes you can harvest them uh, and still get them to, uh, to color up with no problem. <clears throat> Harvest is usually by hand, uh, especially for uh, the ornamental type pumpkins. Uh, processing pumpkins is a different story. They do have means for uh, uh, for harvesting uh, mechanically, but of course, since we want the pumpkins to still not be bruised and look pretty, hand harvest is by far the way uh, for uh, ornamental pumpkins and jack o' lantern pumpkins. For most of the larger jack-o'-lanterns, you're going to need to uh, cut the stem with the pruning shears they, it, to get the best, uh, um, best, best results. So uh, the, those handles or stems are very important. Um, in some cases, for stacking purposes, you wouldn't have to have a handle for a pumpkin. But uh, a handleless pumpkin is often kind of sad, and I will say from experience, does not sell very well. So be careful when you're stacking them and other things to preserve the handles. Um, probably one of the, the sounds I hate to hear the most is kind of like a fingernails on a chalkboard is when a pumpkin rolls into a bin and I can hear the handle snap off as it lands in the bottom. So <clears throat> I will say on some of the gourds and smaller things, they will snap off of the vine so you can take and carefully um, basically twist them and they will easily snap off. A lot of them have very hard stems and they will snap off without having to cut them, which is handy, especially on the smaller ones because it makes it a little easier with the larger quantity of the smaller fruits to try to, to not have to cut individual ones. So the next question is, so you're harvesting, how to transport? Well, there are a myriad of ways um, ranging from and, uh, various things. My recent personal favorite is actually some of uh, a, a pallet-based uh, bin, so a bin that can be moved around on a pallet fork. Um, actually, this is a, a new uh, style of bin that actually I had found and personally uh, am trying out that I really like. It's actually made out of a food grade plastic, which isn't important for pumpkins, but it's nice if you ever want to use it for something else. It has a drop down side, and it's also the sides can collapse so that in the off season they're easy to store. Um, oftentimes, there's old wooden bins that are, are pallet sized from orchards and other things, those work great. 
they can be a little bit hard to store, but this is something that I tried out this year and and really liked. Um, anything you can do as if you start harvesting pumpkins, anything you can do to limit the number of times you have to handle the pumpkin, that, that's a, a space saver and benefit to you. So hence where this way, they get picked from the field into usually small buckets. They get dumped directly in the bin. The bin sits in a shed, and then they go out from there. So that saves versus taking them, dumping in the back of a pickup truck, and then having to pick them back up, unload them, dump them out somewhere else, and so on. This is definitely an advantage. So some other options. Oh, I've done just about anything, and others have done the same. So you can see it can be, you know, trailers, um, wagons, um, pickup trucks stacked to their capacity, um, you name it. Pumpkins will stack miraculously well on the back of a pickup truck. Uh, you can probably impress yourself. Um, trailers, anything, there's various things you can see. Those are all modes of transportation. Commercially, the uh, bottom left, you can see a lot of times you see these, have all seen these in stores, you have uh, cardboard bins that sit on uh, wooden pallets that are used commercially to ship pumpkins on a larger scale or for wholesale. That's a, uh, a great way to, uh, to move pumpkins around. You can stack them, in some cases two or three or maybe even four high, I think, uh, if you have forklift capacity and ability to do it and have a large store and have a large storeroom like this operation. I will say though that that bottom picture is not from my farm. That's actually a large commercial operation. But but that's something uh, to think about. And you can even though you might not have the facilities like that commercial operation, think about how you can incorporate small aspects of how they handle pumpkins into your operation. Uh, when I first started, <clears throat> I was strictly using any kind of apparatus with a bed or any container I could come up with. And as time went on, I realized that there were some better ways, and that's how I moved into some of these bins and other things. You'll realize that uh, it's, it's good to get yourself a start, but you'll soon realize that some of these, some of these other uh, containers can really save you a lot of time and labor, which can be uh, very valuable, especially in harvest season. Uh, marketing, uh, marketing. There's many. We could have a whole discussion, of course, on any of these subjects, including marketing. Uh, direct marketing can be, of course, very uh, lucrative. You can set up farmers markets. Uh, you can have direct farm marketing, where people come out to your farm. Uh, you also can have um, on-farm agritourism operations. Everyone, of course, has either heard or seen some of the. You know, commercial pumpkin patches with corn maize and kids' activities and all those things. Another thing as far as marketing, uh, custom displays. So a lot of times, uh, maybe nicer restaurants, um, you know, local businesses might be looking to have maybe a, a small display. You have a couple of a uh, bale or two of hay, some pumpkins, a corn shock, and you have a really nice display. So that could be another avenue for marketing pumpkins. And there's a wholesale. Um, you can, of course, if you can get it into larger stores, that's great. But you know, don't forget about your local stores. One of the ways I started off was actually going to some local, more independently owned stores uh, and uh, asking them about, you know, if they'd be interested in selling pumpkins. And that's one of the main ways that uh, I know that I got to start or did some of my initial marketing. Uh, with respect to, uh, you know, uh, pumpkins. So that's uh, another great way. A lot of these stores are very willing, especially with the emphasis on local foods, in, uh, in exploring those avenues and trying to get more locally produced products in. So just as we're kind of, I'm starting to wrap up, but what I wanted to do was to give you a example of a typical growing season. And for, for, for what it's worth, I decided to use something uh, similar to what, or basically model this off of what have I do personally, and this is in southern Illinois. Uh, so in, remember, some of these tactics work better in, uh, in southern Illinois versus uh, northern or, or uh, what have you. But this is what I do just to give you a sample of how I approach pumpkin production, looking at it from the holistic standpoint as the, the whole season as a whole. So I'll start transplants depending on the year, but somewhere around um, mid to early June, so I said the 6th to 10th of June. 
And uh, after that, this will be wheat harvest. Again, this is, I'm growing pumpkins no-till transplanted, and this is after wheat. Uh, at that point, I'll spray a burn down or pre-emergence herbicide or a combination of both. So that way I'm starting clean and also hopefully have some extended weed control. I go through and sickle mow the wheat stubble or you can use a disc mower. Some use a roller or other things on other cover crops. Um, more or less, I want to get as much of the residue laying flat on the soil where it's of most benefit to me. So that's why I spend that, that's why I justify spending that extra time to do that. Somewhere around uh, June 28th to say July 5th, so late June, early July is when I would, my goal to get transplants to be out in the field, so I'd transplant the plants. And usually when I do this, it would be with a starter fertilizer and also an insecticide drench to give them a good head start on their growth and then also to protect them early on. Um, that's one of the most critical times to keep insects out because you need to make sure that you have, uh, especially when the plants are small, some, in, uh, some insect injury could actually take out entire plants. So you want to make sure to protect them. So after that, the plants are set. And for the time, and continue to scout for weeds, insects, and disease issues. And again, this would be throughout the rest of the growing season. Probably one of the first things I would do would be to make a herbicide application for a grass control and also for uh, and to make directed sprays, like I mentioned earlier, for broadleaf weeds. Uh, so that would be to, con usually I'll, I will go back to do some secondary weed control in addition to the pre-emergence, but I try to limit it as best I can. And then, of course, along with that, there's also usually at least uh, at least one afternoon of walking through with a hoe or just walking through and yanking out weeds that have escaped all other tactics. So continuing on, late July, this is typically whenever I would look to be starting a fungicide and insecticide, so that's bactericide sprays. So in this case, you would scout and make sprays accordingly uh, every 10 to 14 days is what I shoot for. Some say as much as every t as once as every seven days, I tend to <clears throat> lean more towards the two week time frame. Um, some of that is more just uh, practical from a practical standpoint and what I have time to accomplish, but somewhere in that range is usually what we think of for uh, those sprays. <clears throat> Typically, I'll have anywhere from three to five sprays in a growing season, depending on how the season falls and when the uh, insect or disease pressure seems to be showing up. If some cases, I, I will, my goal is to push those applications as late as I can, especially on insects I will, and diseases, I will scout fairly heavily and at the first, you know, uh, hint of a problem, then I'll address that accordingly. Uh, and then probably once I start, usually then try to keep on a uh, around a two-week uh, spray interval. However, then once you get into September, depending on the season and what I how the life of the crop and the weather, whether I want to add an additional spray in September or if I think the plants will be able to hold out on their own without an additional uh, spray. <clears throat> so that continues, and then by early September. This would be the start of some initial harvest. And then, of course, mid-September through mid-October would be your main harvest. So, in summary, uh, pumpkins and gourds can be a great addition to any small farm enterprise. So, it's definitely, like I said before, a great niche market. Um, you know, there's a, <clears throat> unlike, you know, some of the other um, fruits and vegetables, it has a very kind of targeted audience and, of course, targeted time of year, so that can work very well. Um, they're relatively easy to grow on most of our soils, especially in Illinois and the Midwest, and they're easy to store. You know, you don't have to have a cooler for pumpkins. You don't have to, uh, you know, have some of those things you'd have to have for other vegetables. However, they do need to, pests do need to be managed, uh, whether it be weeds, insects, uh, diseases that you will have to have some strategy for managing those in order to have success. There's some, I think there's some really good marketing opportunities for pumpkins. Um, you know, pumpkins seem to be in, increasing in popularity, especially with the diversity and variety. I think there's just lots of uh, opportunities there. 
and it is lots of work, but it also can be lots of fun. I mean, there's nothing more fun than seeing a little kid running around, uh, picking up little uh, uh, little uh, pumpkins and gourds, and uh, and they won't let go of them because they parents don't want them to take them and they won't let go of them and and just you know just seeing all the uh how much everyone loves pumpkins young and old so one last uh one last plug before we finish up here if you're interested in <clears throat> especially in anything i always like to encourage people to uh jo sign up for the illinois fruit and vegetable news uh newsletter if there's 20 issues per year you can get it by mail for uh, uh for 23 dollars but for most people uh, one of the best ways is you can get it free via the web, and you can uh, you can download it via that website I have listed. Uh, and also, if you send an email to Rick Weinzero at uh, his email address, which is listed there, he'll sign you up to uh, where you'll receive notifications every time a new uh, newsletter comes out. So you can go to that. Uh, in that case, it's free and it gives great information as far as upcoming events and also, you know, uh, uh, to date and uh, current uh, pest management issues you might be dealing with and addressing. So uh, it's uh, definitely a great resource. And there's also some Nathan, more. there's two questions there at the very end for you. Sure. There's also uh, some similar newsletters in uh, in other states. So. So one last thing, I'm going to finish up this last slide and then I'll take all of your questions and we'll try to wrap things up. So I do want to uh, promote any of you, if you're interested um, in learning more about pumpkins, um, the uh, this coming fall on September 4th, um, I will actually be coordinating with the hosting the annual Pumpkin Field Day. So it will be in Southern Illinois at the University of Illinois Ewing Demonstration Center, which is in a small, small town of Ewing, Illinois, which is about 15 minutes south of Mount Vernon. And uh, there'll be more information coming up, but we're, we are going to have lots of variety trials. So if you really want to see, uh, hopefully, uh, true uh, diversity of uh, varieties, this is a great way to come walk around, uh, see some of the uh, different uh, varieties of pumpkins uh, and how they grow in the field, get to, uh, get to see ripe fruit and see the differences between side by side with one and another. There will be demonstration plots on the weed control and, and uh, other pest management and get to see no-till production and, and others. So make sure, excuse me, make sure to check the uh, Illinois uh, Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter. Uh, or the uh, Small Farms, uh, University of Illinois Small Farms Educator Team website, which you can see the link below. And both of those closer to time will have information uh, on, the, uh, on the field day and more specific to those events. So make sure to uh, look on that. So with that, I will go ahead and open up to any uh, questions. And I know we already have a few, uh, a few in the chat box. So. Uh, so with that, there's my contact information, and certainly um, feel free to uh, email or you can call either way, especially if you have specific questions that I wasn't able to get to. I apologize. I try to keep things moving as best we can within our time frame, but I'm happy if you email me. Uh, I'm happy to get with you on, uh, on any specifics you might have. So, all right, with that, I will, I'm going to page back and get to some of these questions. Uh, <clears throat> from Kankakee, you have uh, what soil type do I grow on? Uh, I grow on a um, on more of a, uh, a silty clay uh, soil. It's actually a uh, uh, what you call a deep lust soil. I'm actually in the uh, in the hills just west of, or just excuse me, just east of the Mississippi River. So on some very deep, well drained soils, but not sandy soils. These are these are fairly high clay soils, so that's the uh, soil type that I'm dealing uh, dealing in. As, as far as uh, how many labor hours to harvest an acre, that is a very good question. Um, I would say it, a lot of it depends on the size. Um, so let's see, I'm just going to throw out some rough numbers, and this is this is kind of rough because I haven't done a lot of just. Uh, 
one by one calculations. Just for jack o' lantern pumpkins, I would say just to go over and to do like one harvest as far as just physically getting them loaded into something and out of the field. Um, I would probably say if you say you had maybe let's just say you had two people afternoon or so, I don't know if that kind of gives you an idea, but then there's so many. My problem, I'll have to say, is that I have so many different, I tend to harvest a little bit of one type, and then I'll go harvest some little gourds, and I'll do this and that, so that's why, sorry, I don't have a better uh, answer than that, but you can easily get, um, you know, um, like you see in this last picture here, that uh, uh, I can have, you know, maybe uh, three rows that are, um, oh shoot, I don't know, 150 feet long, and I could easily fill the back of that pickup truck. Uh, so with the jack o' lantern pumpkin, so say if you had three rows laid out, so uh, you know maybe six feet apart, and had uh, so there's uh, you, when you quickly an acre of pumpkins is can be a lot of pumpkins. I actually grow around maybe an acre and a half to two acres, and and most of the pictures you see I can fill. I could fill pickup trucks multiple times off of that. So, and I would say that to you know to pick, let's just say to pick this pickup truck load, maybe it would take, oh I don't know, um, to actually cut them, throw, get them in there, and everything, probably around uh, I don't know, maybe an hour. You know that's from picking them, cutting them off, and everything. So, uh, what factor determines the thickness of larger gourds? Uh, a lot of that just has to do with varieties. Uh, uh, the different varieties have different thicknesses. Um, uh, there are some sometimes weather. If you, I could be somewhat of a determining factor. I would think if maybe if you had more of a drought or dry conditions, you can maybe thinner. If you had you know plenty of moisture and nutrients, maybe a little bit thicker. But a lot of it is, is variety related, and then maybe weather being a secondary factor. I was shooting for an hour, but I knew I would go over just with the information uh, that I had. Uh, so with that, like I say, I, I hope you guys have enjoyed it.